If you want to turn over to the book of Philippians, we're going to, in a few minutes, we're going to spend most of our time uh, in, in the book of Philippians. We're, we won't start there, but we'll get there here in just a few moments. Um, we'll, we'll be looking at some things, mostly in chapters 1 and 2 of Philippians. Uh, but before we do that, I have a quiz that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up here for you to think about for a moment and uh, ask a question. Uh, which will lead into some of the things I'm going to talk about. Are there, are there verses or maybe concepts in the Bible that scare you? When, you? when you read certain things, look at certain things, are there things that maybe make you uncomfortable? Anybody? You want... Yes. Yes, yes. Those that don't know him, he will say, depart from me. Our judgment, yes. Anything, anybody else? Anything specific that you think about? <clears throat> I read in my, in my daily reading, I ran across this one uh, this, this week, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 10. I, the Lord, searched the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. That makes you a little uncomfortable. What else? Anybody else? Mark? Go ahead, Adam. Yes. Yes. Mark? You can find it now, but the verse that talks about a city against the spirit that will be forgiven. Yes. Yes. Sinning, uh, sinning against the Holy Spirit in, in, a, in a way that can't be forgiven is what Mark said. Anybody else? The parable of the talents. Which one am I? Which one am I? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Anybody else? So I, 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 bring, I asked that question for this reason. Um, and, and maybe it's a sign of my age, as I know, I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm getting older. Um, it, and when I said I'm not talking about, I'm not teaching about grace tonight, I, I am in a sense um, what I'm going to bring up here in the next few minutes because, again, maybe, maybe it's a sign of my age or maybe it's just recognizing um, in light of what God has done for me, sometimes I recognize how lacking I am in my life of being what he has called me to be. And, and I start reading and looking at scriptures differently than, than maybe I have before. Sometimes you can just read scripture over and over again and you understand it, you know what it means, but maybe you don't take a step back and say, well, what about me? How do, how do I fit the parable of the talents? Uh, it, you know, all, all of these things we read about a lot and study and we get it, we understand it, but do we, do we stop and think about, wow, what about me? Um, and it can, be, it can be sobering when I go back to that passage in Jeremiah when God said, I'm going to test your hearts and your minds and I'm going to, reward you based on that. That's a little bit frightening. So I, I've got a few just, to, just to, for you to think about. So the whole, you know, Matthew chapter 5, and we're not going to read all of this, but obviously Jesus' first sermon that we have recorded, um, we talk about it a lot. It was, it was counter-cultural to what people thought uh, at the time, what the Jews thought at the time. Uh, it reflects 
living a life that is different than the people around us, than the world in general. But when you look at some of the, and I highlighted just a few of the words in there, when you think about it and, and put yourself in the picture, and you could, you could go through the whole list. I just picked out a few. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Am, am I really hungry, hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Is that me? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. All of those things as you read, and we've read them a million times and we get it, but what about me? Now I say that and I say that in the context of, man, that makes me feel uncomfortable, but it, it doesn't from the standpoint of what y'all have been studying about and that is God's grace that God has given us a gift in Jesus. That though I may not be perfect in all these things that we see, God has given us a gift. What about this one? Also in Matthew chapter five, love your enemies and pray for those who, we read that, we understand it, we, we know what it means. And what do we say when we read that verse? We're teaching. What do we say about it? Nobody says anything about that verse. It is difficult. We always say it is hard to do to love my enemies. That is hard. Um, so does that mean we don't have to do it? No, it doesn't mean that. It's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. When Jesus said it to the, the people he said it to, it was hard for them. He didn't say, okay, if, you know, try this and see if you can make this. No, he said, this is, this is who you are. Verse 40, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It's hard. It's hard, but it doesn't mean we don't do it. What about this one? Galatians chapter five. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. <clears throat> um, turn over to Romans chapter eight. We're gonna read that real quick. What does that mean? What, what, when Paul wrote this to the Galatians, what is he telling them? What is he telling them about who they are, who we are? He's listing characteristics there. He's listing fruit. <clears throat> Mark? Yeah, this is our life. This is who we are. It's the fruit of the spirit. Paul would write in Romans chapter eight, beginning in verse five, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So this is, this is the life in the spirit. This is who we are. These are the characteristics that I am supposed to have in my life. And I look at those and think, oh, am I, 
how am I doing on all that? Do I, do, I, do I exhibit those characteristics in my life to everyone? And it applies to us as we interact with people and not just people we like. It's easy to do. You know, it's easy to demonstrate those characteristics to the, to the people that I, there's even two or three of you in here that I, that I like and I, I, I will demonstrate those two. But what about, how does it apply to husbands and wives as we interact with one another? Are we doing that? That may be, that may, maybe that makes us uncomfortable. What about children and parents? Same thing, it applies. What about brothers and sisters? What about spiritual families? What about my neighbor? What about the people? I, it's, it's who we are. And the last one I'll, I'll put up, I think it's the last one. Um, James chapter one and verse two. Uh, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. David, we preached on this uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Uh, what do we say about this verse? It's hard. Count it joy when you meet trials. We don't like trials. We don't like when we face hard things and difficult things. And James says, count it joy. And he'll tell us there's a reason we count it as joy, right? It, it helps us. It develops our character. It get, develops patience and steadfastness. Again, we talk about some of these things and say this is really hard. But we still have to do it. So some of these things are challenging in our lives. And we've been studying Romans in our high school class. And so um, at the end of every class that I taught, I've, I've brought them to this verse. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 about being transformed, not being conformed, but being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Carson taught, uh, preached a sermon on this a little, little while ago. Um, turn over to Romans chapter 5. Back, back to Romans. I'm, I know I'm there a lot, but I've been studying that a lot. Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I go back to my point. God has given us a gift that Paul very well understood. And he says, because of that, we are to be transformed. Our life is to be changed. Our, life, our, our lives are a process of transformation to be more like Jesus each and every day. <clears throat> so my last verse, this is the last one to get us into our, what we're actually going to look at tonight. Um, Paul would write to the Philippians in chapter 2 and in verse 5, well, we'll start in verse 1. He said, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. In verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours 
in Christ Jesus. What I have on the screen is the King James Version. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul would go on to say, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. Where was he when he wrote this letter? Prison, Paul's in prison, he's writing this letter. He's encouraging them to live a life of unity, to live a life of humility. And he admonishes the Philippians in this letter to have the same kind of mind that Jesus had. In this text, in these few verses, when he says that, what are, the, what are the three things that, the three principles that Paul lays out about Jesus? There are three kind of main things in, in, in this, in those, uh, well, seven or eight verses there. What are the three things? <clears throat> he came down as a man. He came down as a man, he, he, even though he was in the form of God, he, what does it say he did? Pardon? Emptied himself, humbled himself. He, he demonstrated humility. He, he, is, he is God, he is, and he humbled himself to come down. What else? What did he take on the, the nature of or the for, form of? Servant. Somebody said, sir, he, he became a servant. He took on the nature of a servant. And then what did he do? What did he do in regards to his father? He obeyed. It, he demonstrated obedience. He demonstrated humility. He demonstrated servanthood, being a servant. And he demonstrated obedience, even obedience to the point of death. So when I think about this, this is the, and this is what got me to this whole line of thinking, I, pr I pray for this almost every day, that God would help me to have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> and I, I think about that from the standpoint, how can I have the mind of Christ? Again, you know, it's, kind of a daunting thing. So our, our task or our challenge in this life is to transform our minds and our lives to be like Christ. Um, and so I'm gonna challenge you in just a moment um, to, consider, to consider your life in the context of this. Thinking about the fact, as I said, the verses that I put up on the screen and, and many others, all of them for that matter, they're not optional. When God tells us what kind of heart to have, what kind of mind to have, he didn't say, uh, you know, only if you think you can do this. Uh, transformation, it's not unlike physical transformation. If I want to transform my body, what does it take, Troy? Discipline. Discipline, that's why I haven't done it yet, but if I were going to do it, it would take, what else? Consistency, what else? Does it take time? It takes time. It takes energy. It takes commitment. If I want to, if I want to look like Cade, that's not gonna happen, but if I did, it would take all of those things for me to do that. So as a disciple of Jesus, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a brother, this, this is what we've been called to do. 
This is what we've been called to do. And again, it seems simple. We can read the verses. We've read them a million times. But it is often hard. So what I would challenge you to think about tonight, is there one aspect of your life that you can begin a process to change, to improve, to assist in this transformation? I put a list up. There's obviously, you know, a thousand things we could think about. Bible study, is that one you need to improve on? I can't, I can't transform my body without doing some work, some weightlifting, some running, some whatever it is. I do those things. Can I be the disciple that God has called me to be without studying his word? Well, we know we, we, know we can't. What about prayer? We're going to talk about that. Uh, in, in just a moment. My form of communicating with my Heavenly Father is through prayer. How am I going to develop my relationship with God if I'm not committed and dedicated and I don't spend the time in prayer? Again, it's one of those things that's simple and we understand it, but are we committed to doing it? What about building relationships with our spiritual family? demonstrating those characteristics that we talked about. You guys are really good at this. I, I, I don't discount that at all. What about our commitment to attendance of worship and Bible study? Being with my spiritual family, am I committed to doing that? What about my zeal for teaching others about Jesus? Am I, am I, am I committed to doing that? Am I committed to working on doing that? Not all, not all of us are good at it, some of us are better than, but am I willing to work? What about leading our families to be closer to God? Am I willing to put the time and commitment into that? What about setting the proper example for my family, for my friends, for my neighbors, for people that I work with? Kind of back to what Carson talked about today. What about my generosity for help and helping others? What about my love for others, even those that I may not really like? And again, the list could go on and on. Um, but the transformation that we go through, having the mind of Christ, um, doesn't necessarily, it's not going to happen all at once. It's a step-by-step -step process. It's a day-by-day -day process. It's a habit-by-habit -habit process. Um, and I can look at somebody else and say, boy, they sure need to, they need to transform. They need to change. But do I, am, am I willing to look in the mirror? and figure that out for myself. And I would just throw this out there. If you need help in some area of your life, whether it's one of these or something, if you need help with that, ask somebody. There are plenty of people here that, that are really good at some or all of these things that maybe they can help you figure out, how do I do this? How, how, do, I, how do I become better in my Bible study? How do I become better in prayer? One of, one of the turning points for me in my prayer life I'll, I'll admit to this, a number of years ago was I would, I would encounter people here and other places that maybe, you know, maybe it was sickness, maybe it was something, and I would tell them, I'm going to pray for you. And then I'd forget to do it. And the more I thought about that, I thought, I can't do that. And so I realized I've got to, I've got to change how I do this. And I, and I developed a much better routine for me that works, that helps me in my prayer life. That's just, that's just one example. But let's look, let's look at uh, in Philippians chapter 1. I'm gonna, we're going to back up there just for a moment. Uh, I want to look at a few things that Paul had to say to the Philippians. <clears throat> um, he begins in chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus... To all the saints in Christ Jesus who were at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day 
of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are, you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruits of righteousness that come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So as Paul begins this letter to the Philippians, there, he, he begins with some things regarding his brothers and sisters there at Philippi. The first thing to note is Paul's constant prayer for the saints at Philippi. And his prayer for these saints, for these Christians in Philippi, begins with his thanksgiving for them and for their partnership in the gospel. And Paul demonstrates a great confidence that they would continue in their, war, in their good work, that this, this partnership, this fellowship would continue. And his prayer that their love would abound. And what is his prayer regarding their love and how it would abound? How, did he, how does he describe that? He doesn't just leave it at that. I pray that your love would abound. What does he say? He says, I pray that your love would abound with knowledge and with all discernment. What is discernment? We understand knowledge. They're supposed to... As their knowledge grows, their love is going to grow. What is discernment? What's another word for that? Understanding. So he says, I, I, I pray that your love will grow more and more, but with knowledge and discernment. What else does he say about it? What, what, was the, what does he want the result of that to be, of their love growing in this way? He says, so that you can approve what is excellent, and so you can be pure and blameless. Paul says, I am praying for you constantly, and I am praying that your love will abound in knowledge and understanding, and that the result of that is going to be something very positive for them, that they would be pure and blameless, and they would be filled with the fruit of the right. So as I look at my life, and I think, um, oh man, I've got this pure heart thing I've got to deal with. I, I, I'm, I've got to be blameless. Um, Paul gives them a recipe here. He says, "You pray. I'm praying that your love is going to abound based on knowledge and based on understanding. And the result of that is going to be these things. So a few, and then he says in verse 11, that you will be filled with the fruit of righteousness. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit, right, that he wrote to the Galatians about. And he says here that you're going to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. That's what we're called to be. So my first, my first life principle in looking at this first part of the text um, we talked about it in, in chapter 2, but Paul begins the letter by identifying himself and Timothy as what? Servants of Christ Jesus. And then he talks about it in reference to Jesus in chapter 2 that we've already looked at. In the simplest things and in the hardest things, our humility and our ability to be servants has to, has to shine through. It has to come through because that's who we are. And Paul, with all, with all the uh, accolades that you could give Paul, he constantly refers to him as a servant of Jesus. And he was not afraid to claim his servanthood. And this is... This is 
one of the main points as Paul is, is instructing the Philippians here on how to have the mind of Christ, it's centered around the humility of Christ. It's centered around the humility of Christ. The second thing I would just point out, constant and consistent prayer is vital to having the mind of Christ. He says in verse 4, always and in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. That's, that's, a, that's a constant, that's a consistent Every time I pray for you, always when I'm praying for you, this is, there was a consistency in, we, we see multiple examples of Jesus taking time, going off, often by himself, to pray, to pray to God. We see, we see multiple examples. Paul would write to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and he says what? Pray without ceasing. There's a, there's a constant and a consistency that has to be there in our prayer life in order to have the mind of Christ. The next thing I would, Paul had, Paul had confidence as a Christian. He had confidence in these other Christians at Philippi in what was going to happen and how they were going to act, how they were going to respond. Having confidence as a Christian helps us develop the mind of Christ. Now that doesn't mean that confidence doesn't negate humility. I can be humble, I can demonstrate humility, but I can have confidence in God and I can have confidence in my salvation because of the gift that God has given to me. I've got several verses listed here, we don't have time to go through them, that all you know, Acts 28, when Paul is in Rome, it talks about him preaching with boldness or confidence. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 4 is the same thing. Paul had confidence in the Lord. In Hebrews, in a couple of verses there, it talks about hold fast our confidence. Um, in, in Romans, in chapter 15, and I just taught uh, the, the high school class, Paul talks about, I can boast but I'm boasting in the Lord. I'm boasting in what God has done, not what I've done. So having confidence in the Christian helps us develop the mind of Christ. And then the next one, there is no greater service we can give to our friends, our brothers and sisters, than to pray for them. We can help them in lots of ways, and we should be helping them in lots of ways. But we all have the ability to pray for them. We don't all have the same ability to give and, you know, maybe provide. You know, there's lots of things we do. Not everybody has the same. We all have the ability to pray. And we all have the ability to pray for our brothers and sisters. And tell people that you are praying for them. That, that's a... Um, it, is, it is a not an infrequent thing that, that, and I know David would say the same thing, that I get texts from people from you telling me that you're, you've, you're praying for me as, as an elder here. I mean, that's, that's a tremendous feeling. Um, so what a great thing to do for our brothers and sisters and, and let them know. So kind of putting those together and back to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Developing the mind of Christ develop, includes developing a deep confidence and practice of prayer. And Paul is very, um, he, he talks about that to the Philippians a lot in terms of what he is doing for them in praying for them. Going on into, oh man, looking at the clock. Going on into to verse 12 of chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So understanding the um, relationship that Paul had with these Philippians, these Christians in Philippi, uh, you, you have to know that the, the Christians there were concerned about Paul. What, what, what's happening to Paul? What kind of condition? What's going on? He's in prison. You know, that, this is a natural thing. What's going to happen to Paul? And Paul is sitting there telling them, look, the gospel has been advanced in Rome because I've, I've been in prison. And we've, we've said this. Paul is a prisoner as he writes the letter. Um, well, I'm not going to have time to go into those, those verses. Nothing in this letter, though, hints of a complaint by Paul. But Paul rejoiced that because of his bonds, it had made possible for the gospel to be advanced in, in very unexpected ways. What does he say? It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Um, sometimes, maybe more than we think about, Sometimes, Curtis holds that five-minute sign up. Um, Satan will put obstacles in our way, in the way of preaching the gospel. How do we react to those obstacles? How do we deal with those obstacles? Paul, Paul didn't let the fact that he was in Rome, he was in prison, he had people guarding him. He didn't let that stop him. Uh, he said it's, it's become widely known, even in this prison, in, in terms of all these guards, that I'm in prison because of Christ, not because of something I've done. And Paul rejoiced. Even his bonds had made it possible for the gospel to advance. Um, I'm going to skip down just for a moment because I've got a lot of stuff here and we're not going to get to it. Um, but this life principle, as we think about what Paul is telling these Philippians, being transformed, being transformed will give us a complete conviction in our faith and a, and a thorough understanding of our mission that will lead us to spread the gospel no matter what our circumstances are. That was the mind of Christ. He came, he came to, that's what, our lesson this morning with Paul, uh, with Carson. He came to seek and save the lost. His circumstances often were not the best, but that didn't stop him. Unpleasant uh, things will happen to us as Christians. Having the mind of Christ will determine how we respond to those circumstances. We read in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul goes through the list of all the things that he had endured uh, as a disciple. Um, Paul's, as we said, Paul's bonds became known. I'm going to skip down. I'm going to go back to my last, uh, or, or my, where I was a moment ago. So as we think about that, as you think about the mind of Christ, as we think about things in our lives that we look at and say, Ooh, that's really hard. Or I don't know where I stand with that. First of all, we, we acknowledge the gift that God has given to us. We acknowledge the grace that God has given to us. That I'm not perfect. I'm not going to be perfect. But I'm going to live my life in the Spirit. And I'm going to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit that God has called me to do, even though it may be difficult, even though it may be hard, that's who I am. That's, that's the life I've been called to as a child of God. And with God's help and with the help of my brothers and sisters, I can do that. So I have to, I have to examine my life and I have to think about 
all the things in my life and figure out what do I need to improve? What do I need to change? How do I transform my life? And maybe it's one of these things or maybe it's something completely different. But those are the things we have to think about. So as we read scripture, as we read where Paul tells them, you have the mind of Christ, think about that from a personal perspective. How do I do that? How do I change my life so that I have the mind of Christ? That seems daunting. That seems difficult. But in, in the context that Paul writes to the Philippians here, he's dealing with their humility, their uh, ability to have the same mind and to be in, in, in sync with one another. Not doing things from selfish ambition or conceit, but with humility count others more significant than yourselves. Sometimes that's hard. But that's what Paul told him to do. And he said, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So I would suggest every day we pray that we have the mind of Christ. Every day that we pray to be more like Jesus. But then figure out, how do I do that? What do I do in my life that helps that come true? that helps me each day to be more and more like Jesus. Anyway, thank you for your attention tonight.